There's just so much about regular show that clicks with me. Whether it's seeing my teenage self in the characters, or relating to very adult problems that the show addresses in pretty creative ways. But for me, the best thing about the show is its half-hour specials. I find them to be some of regular show's best efforts, and the episodes I end up going back to the most. And it's interesting because there's many different levels to these specials. They can be an all-out battle, they can focus on character growth, they can be quiet, they can be hectic, and yet, the majority of them seem to do whatever they're doing great. Now, most of regular show specials are holiday specials, case in point. So out of fairness, I'm not going to include any holiday specials. But of the non-holiday specials, some of them are among my all-time favorite episodes from the show. So, let's get to ranking them. Now, I wouldn't say all of regular show specials are good, but I would say all of their non-holiday specials are at least good. This is actually one case where I don't have a clear least favorite, but I put this one at the bottom just because it is one of the more less eventful specials. It's about the park being scheduled to be domed up to create a contained ecosystem, but because Benson seemingly gets the date wrong, the crew gets trapped inside the dome, and Benson feels someone is setting him up. And this results in Benson stumbling upon a bigger plan going on inside the dome. I really appreciate this special because it turns Benson into a badass. I mean, he's Rambo in this episode. And considering he's going up against a bunch of scientists, it's kind of fitting that he'd be able to handle his own against them. It doesn't feel overblown or like they're totally ignoring his normal character traits just to make the episode work. Hell, his whole motivation is nothing more than he wants to prove he was right. Our plans have surely been made apparent to you by this point. Why we put a dome over the park and pumped it full of oxygen. Why we switched the date on your email. Ah! Why we... Ah! So you admit you did change the date! But I think what makes me rank this special low is that it's a bit of a slow burner. The first half feels a bit dragged out, and the second half feels like it could have used a little more substance. Like, I can't help but wonder if Pam was more of a spur-of-the-moment romance for Benson, since this is her first debut and she plays a role in trying to trap him. But neither of them even mention that when they start becoming friends. I mean, at least planting the seeds to their relationship would have been a nice addition here if you ask me. But none of it even feels like it hurts the episode too much. In fact, even though a few of their jokes are a bit lazy, they still have a lot of punch to them and are interesting as visual pieces as well as jokes. Watching Benson run through a hallway of fakes is both entertaining and creative in its own way to me. And it helps the episode stand out a bit. Benson, <laughs> slow down! I'm your girlfriend, Audrey! We broke up months ago! Overall, it's a good special. It's got its boring moments, and I would say the rest of these specials are more memorable. But from start to finish, it's a special that never really loses my attention or focus and keeps me invested in what's actually going on. But then again, so does every other special on this list, so let's continue. You know your old pal Benson's motto? Don't sweat the small stuff. He's a fake! Get him! <laughs> what the heck is this? I'm not sure how people felt about Thomas, but to me, I would say he didn't really add or detract from the show. He was always a character that was just there. But I think that was the point because, according to J.G. Quintel, Thomas was created because many of the show's staff members had been interns before they got to work with regular show. And as is typical of most interns, they witness pretty interesting events that happen and have some pretty interesting stories from their internships. And I think that's why Thomas was just kind of there. It's honestly a fitting role for an intern character. But that being said, he was given his moments. Hell, his first appearance on the show I'll be talking about later on this list. But this one right here is a nice little Spy Revealed episode. It's about the park crew finding out Thomas is really a secret Russian agent named Nikolai. You know, I thought something seemed off after Thomas fights back. It almost felt like he'd done that before. I could go undercover as an intern and gather information. My name will be Nicholas. Maybe this should have been the biggest shock of the episode for me. What about Audrey? We broke up, remember? What? And it turns out Thomas infiltrated the park in order to steal it for Russia. And it's interesting because while this is a spy episode, 
It still takes a unique approach to its execution because it combines the role of a spy with the role of an intern into a well thought out, fun, engaging episode. And the humor isn't too bad either. I mean, it's not the funniest special by any means, but it does have its moments. Like the reveal of what Russia wants to use the park for. It's a great representation of countries just bullying each other. This is a violation of the treaty. Oh, we aren't firing any missiles. Why are you hitting yourself, America? Well, he's got us there, Mr. Davis. But there is more focus on showing the development of Thomas and how strongly he actually cares for the park and the park staff. And this special highlights a big reason I enjoy these specials. Most of them don't take too much time before stuff hits the fan. This one, Thomas gets found out roughly six minutes into the episode. And that's actually one of the longest times a special on this list takes to get going. I mean, Rigby finds out right at the start, but of course, no one believes him. And it would have been very easy to pad out this episode with Rigby trying to catch Thomas, using stupid tactics that just get old after a while, and rob the episode of some rewatchability. But the episode only does that once, and then moves on to Thomas getting caught. To me, that at the very least shows confidence in the episode and what the staff could do with it. And even though I rank this pretty low, it's still a fun watch. I mean, there's nothing like a good spy episode. And I am a Russian spy. Dude, for real? <clears throat> yeah, I am a Russian spy. I was tempted to rank this special higher just because of one singular moment. But it does feel like there are some flaws and missed opportunities in this special, and compared to the rest, it feels like this one didn't make the most of its time like it could've. It's about Rigby graduating from high school and being selected to deliver an inspirational graduation speech on live TV. So for the most part, it deals with the pressure that giving speeches can cause, and considering the fact that public speaking is considered many people's greatest fears, even more so than death, this is an episode that's pretty easy to relate to. But I think one element that holds this episode back is Mordecai. Now I totally get what they're going for, because a few times in my adult life, I felt this kind of unnecessary resentment. And it's usually not because you're mad at your friend for succeeding or anything, it's just because it sometimes forces you to look at all the goals in life that you're behind on, and kind of question what it is you could be doing wrong. But I think the way Mordecai is portrayed muddles that message a bit. There are some visuals that try to show it, but they go by so fast and leave such little initial impact. And Mordecai feels more selfish because he doesn't really explain it. He just mopes around most of the episode. Is all this really necessary? I mean, graduating from high school is like the least a person can accomplish. But it's a big deal for Rigby. I can't believe I have to explain this to him. And when he does open up to Rigby about it, it still feels like he was just being selfish. I know how messed up this sounds, but it's hard to see you doing so great. I guess I always kind of liked that I was doing better than you before. But when I heard you embarrassing yourself out there, I realized how unfair I was being. Thanks, Dick. I appreciate it. But I do still admire the attempt because the episode feels like it's trying to focus on both character growth and character recession. And it does that by making Rigby more responsible in his own way, and Mordecai more destructive in his own way. A complete role reversal. And while I think it botched Mordecai a bit, it more than made up for that by highlighting Rigby's struggles. They're not only relatable, but I felt every bit of them. And what made this entire special for me was Rigby's speech at the end because it not only sums up his character arc throughout the last few seasons, but the main focus of it is that you don't need to change yourself to better yourself. You can change aspects of yourself, you can change routines you do, you can change bad habits you have, but you don't have to stop having fun or stop hanging with your friends or stop anything that makes you, you to do that. I may not be the man I used to be, the one who didn't graduate from high school, but unexpectedly, awesomely, I could still do the fun stuff he did. Honestly, this speech is one of the biggest reasons that Rigby is my favorite character. It shows how he genuinely bettered himself during the show's run, and it made me realize that it all happened at a pace that's slow, but noticeable, just like a regular person. And that ending... I mean, I watched this show very late, so I knew going into this episode that the 8th season took place in space. But even watching this with that knowledge... 
I knew that if I saw this ending the day the episode aired, I would have been hyped for the last season. And even re-watching it, it's still a pretty intense ending. Very little of that leaves even when I know what's coming. So yeah, overall, it's not as exciting and it's got its flaws, but its main focus is on growing up. And for me, uh, this is a special that just seems to get more and more meaningful over time. And after you, more people! I am gonna eat my crusts. I'm gonna eat my leafy greens. And look, Roy's walking! You know what this special is? It's regular show, the anime. So there was no doubt I was gonna enjoy this one. It's about Mordecai, Rigby, and the baby ducks being pestered by a toy company called Playco to sell them their likeness so they can make crummy action figures of them. So Playco and its allies join forces and engage with the park staff and the baby ducks in an epic all-out battle. And the anime aspect is actually blended in really nice here. It literally keeps trying to top itself with how much it can add to the same character, and it's all executed in a way that does poke fun at the tropes, but is still loving to the art form. And while the episode is more in the style of Power Rangers, there's still so many anime references worked in, like Zeta Gundam, Cowboy Bebop, and... Oh my god, Full Metal Alchemist. Yeah, they, they know what they're doing. And that's just the few references I can name. And while anime style episodes are nothing new, there's so much original regular show goodness here that this episode still manages to stand out in its own way. Also, as crazy as this show is, I like that they make an acknowledgement that they don't care that much about continuity or anything for this episode. This episode is all about just having a blast, and anyone who takes it too seriously, uh, well, they can just go suck it. Hey! Oh! And I do appreciate that this whole fight is pretty much a big representation of trying to avoid becoming a sellout. I mean, I think that's a word that not many people actually understand. Like, I remember people calling Fallout Boy sellouts for being on the Night Begins to Shine special. But to be a sellout, you gotta go back on your morals in exchange for cash. And unless Fallout Boy made a statement beforehand, saying they hated Teen Titans Go or they were against ever appearing on kid shows, they're not sellouts for just appearing on it. But that's pretty well portrayed here. It establishes pretty quickly what their morals are and why they don't want to make the deal but the episode progressively works up to them almost becoming what they hated. And I like that this episode used that as the center of this fight, because no matter how strong your morals are, it can actually be a hard-fought battle to not give in so you can be financially secure for the rest of your life. So I think this was a fun way to show that, and I especially love the payoff of how they got out of it. It's just a great jab at companies like this and what they'll stoop to. We're the bad guys! The contract even says so! Nah, it looks like the contract says you're the bad guys. Overall, this is a genuinely epic episode. I mean, it has a lot of what you would want from this show. Fun action, a nice combination of obvious and subtle jokes, and a great use of anime references that show a true amount of love for the genre. It's an episode that deserves to call itself brilliant. Skips is a great character. I mean, to be fair, any character voiced by Mark Hamill is already awesome in my eyes, but Skips literally doesn't even need that. He's an immortal, knowledgeable, loyal, and faithful guy who also happens to defend the universe from time to time. So as you can imagine, a backstory special was pretty much guaranteed. And there was information dropped about Skips throughout the first five seasons, but probably the most interesting bit of knowledge, at least for me, uh, involved his name. In all my life, my heart yearned for only one woman. And we used to skip together all the time. And that's what most of this episode focuses around. Skip's relationship with this girl named Mona, who meant that much to him, and how it led up to Skip's becoming what he is. And for the record, a lot of the episodes I find the most entertaining from this show usually revolve around Skip's, because, as you'd expect from an immortal, universal hero, Skip's knows a lot of standout characters. And the episode makes sure to put focus on their younger days, quote-unquote younger days, 
by showing their high school lives. There's also a nice amount of references thrown in, some subtly, and some that don't even have to be subtle. A long time ago, in a high school far, far away. But what's nice is that none of these elements overshadow the episode's main focus, which is Skips and Mona's relationship. And personally, I think it's an excellent love story. The majority of it is tied into what made Skips and Clordbane from Fists of Fury rivals, and how Skips ended up having to defend the universe from him. And because Skips was a more coarse guy in the past, it progressively shows how Mona changed him, and it connects all these traits that made Skips who he is, patience, handmanship, and mortality, all to her. But they're all presented through montages or they're worked up to. So the main focus always stays on Skips and Mona, without having these backstory elements overshadow them. So we get a full view of what these two were like and a real sense of their relationship. And despite it only being shown in full in this one episode, it still feels like I went on a journey with them and I was genuinely heartbroken by the ending, even though I knew from the start it would end that way. On the day I lost her, I vowed to skip every day for the rest of my life. And I don't think this show handles relationships that well, so... For them to manage that, yeah, it really makes this episode stand out in a strong way for me. Overall, Skips' story is one of regular show's best stories. This is by leaps and bounds one of regular show's best episodes. Remember what I said about The Real Thomas being one of the slowest specials to get going? This one gets going in like 30 seconds. It opens with Thomas's first ever appearance, a brief bit of exposition on him, and then... Mom, hold on! Absolute chaos, and it never loses that momentum. It leaves you wondering what's happening, but it fills the holes in piece by piece, and in ways that are still engaging. All the characters are living different lives, and Mordecai and Rigby are left to remind them who they are, but their new lives fit surprisingly well with their original personalities. Like making Muscle Man an egocentric college professor. Yeah, he's smart now, but he's still arrogant and obnoxious. Besides, I don't have time to tell you. I'm late for my lecture on quantum mechanics. Brainiac. And the way they break everyone out of their trances with their most popular forms of humor is pretty cool too. I honestly think regular show can tell the same joke about 50 times because odds are they'll find 50 genuinely different ways to deliver it. And that just further increases the chance that some of them are going to keep the jokes fresh. Heck, most of this episode is reviving some of its old jokes and bringing them back in a climactic fashion. And I mean climactic, it's one of the most intense moments from the show. I mean, some of these characters are absolutely ridiculous and goofy, but man, when you put them together like that, they really look like a force to be reckoned with. And it's the first episode that really feels like it's going above and beyond. I mean, there's no shortage of effort from most of the episodes in the first three seasons, but this episode intensifies everything the show does right. It's a creative, crazy story that still makes logical sense. It works in real-world elements and out-of-the-box ways that fit its crazy logic, as well as becomes more obvious as its audience grows up. And it still has fun. Its big battle at the end is one of the most enjoyable scenes from the whole show. And in a way, I feel like this episode is trying to set what Thomas is supposed to be. A character that just provides that little something extra to get their episodes going. And in this episode, he does that perfectly. He doesn't distract, and sometimes adding in an extra piece can help you create more formulas. And after three seasons, I wouldn't be surprised if they felt the need to add something just to give them a little extra boost. But like I said before, I couldn't tell you what effect it had on its audience, because... For me, I didn't really notice much of a difference in the show with the inclusion of Thomas. 
In fact, I think I'd go as far as to call this episode a bittersweet kind of start for Season 4. It's by far the best seasonal debut from the show. It's so good, in fact, that I kind of suspected the majority of the episodes from this season were just gonna pale in comparison. But this episode remained the key example of everything great about this show. And I think it held that distinction until the very last episode. Hey, Mom. No, no, I, I'm not gonna quit anymore. Yeah, yeah, I think this internship's gonna be really cool. I mean, yeah, this is not only my favorite regular show episode, it's one of the best endings to a kid's show. Everything that made this show great is in this episode. It's intense, it's creative, it's character driven, it's out of the box, it's emotional, and it's all pushed to the absolute max without it feeling like it breaks its own rules to work. This is an episode that's truly anything but regular. It's a three-part episode, with the first part being more of a refresher and a build-up. It shows us Pop's planet and reveals everything that's happened has been destined to repeat itself over and over. And that's interesting because it does set a bit of a limit for itself. It's kind of hard to work in a way around something like that without it feeling like a cop-out. But obviously, whatever plan they came up with in part one wasn't going to work anyway. So they focused more on how they presented everything. And it results in a payoff that really sets the build up for the remaining parts. Because it gives you an accurate feel of how tough this guy really is. <laughs> that tickled. <laughs> God help us! Part two starts the battle off with just pops and anti-pops. And progressively works its way up. But it paces itself very well. It balances suspense and creativity by making Pops vs. Anti-Pops one of the shorter fights before the crews join in, before progressively adding more characters and saving their more intense moments when everyone is part of the battle. So it makes for one hell of a ride before cutting out right when it hits its peak. Yeah, it's pretty much where the episode gets its name. It's nothing but a battle. One thrilling, well-executed, emotional, fun, and very rewatchable battle. Dude, we gotta eject! Not yet! We gotta fly between them! You're crazy! No! And part three is all about the universe breaking apart from Pops and Anti-Pops' fight. Mordecai and Rigby start off in a rerun, which feels like it's more to give the audience a bit of a cooling period after such an intense ending. And it puts them in the pilot episode, The Power, which is genius because not only does it line up with what was stated in part one, but it's the perfect episode for them to make a quick, uncomplicated return. And when they return, the universe starts falling to shambles, but it falls apart just like an animated show would. They start becoming notes, they start losing their color, the environment becomes storyboarded, and even the title falls apart on them. It's like they're breaking everything but the fourth wall, and it picks up the momentum right where part two left it. It's a satisfying continuation to say the least. But I think you all know the biggest reason this episode is number one. The ending. Pops' sacrifice? I mean, that could have easily backfired, but it doesn't feel like it was just thrown in as an unnecessary downer to make its ending memorable. It's handled with grace, there's a big amount of closure behind it, and it feels like it genuinely did have to end that way. That's why it hits me so hard, because as much as I love Pops, it's actually the most fitting thing for his character. A pure embodiment of goodness. Someone who wouldn't bat an eye for a second to anything that would help others, and someone who would continue to spread that kindness and purity to anyone in need up until the end, even to the biggest of grumps. All those one-star reviews, I, I wish I could take it all back. You can try. You and I together, brother. And everything in the end, I mean, it ends for most of the characters as I'd expect. They all go their separate ways, live separate lives, but still manage to come together. And I don't care for a second how cliche that is. It's all presented so nicely. Even Mordecai ending up with a complete nobody. That's the most fitting summary of his relationship. All a big road to nothing. This is as fitting of a partner as he could have taken. And I still felt a sense of nostalgia from Mordecai and Rigby as they relished on all the stuff that's happened. Like, once this episode was over, I was ready to rewatch the entire show from the beginning, 
just because I was already missing it. Like I said, this is one of the best endings to any kid show that I've seen, and I will appreciate it for as long as I possibly can. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next review. Do you think those old video games are still in the shed? Yeah, we should check it out for old cart's sake. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Champion.